Well, good afternoon, everybody, again. It's an enormous pleasure to have uh, the Honourable Louise Arbour with us today, who's very, very graciously agreed to meet with us, uh, even though she's here really for the purposes of getting an honorary doctorate from us, which will be conferred at the graduation ceremony tomorrow. I've had the um, wonderful honorific <coughs> task of uh, being the orator uh, to introduce uh, Louise Arbour tomorrow and to shrink a career as long as this and distinguished as hers has been quite a formidable challenge. But I will just say a few things, um, as you probably know, or some of you know, that Louise Arbour has served in the Supreme Court of Canada. She has been the Chief Prosecutor of the War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, with responsibility for Rwanda and for former Yugoslavia. In 2004, she served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and today she is the CEO and President of the International Crisis Group. So we are extraordinarily privileged to have her with us today to answer questions, and we're going to start with uh, a few reflections from her on the theme of working with states, tools and strategies for securing human rights. We do have to end at five sharp because of a heavy schedule that uh, Louise Abour has. So we will be uh, accelerating the process somewhat, but we have some questions that we'll be putting to her, and there will be a little bit of time for open questions after that. So can I now turn to you, Louise, and ask you to speak to us for a few moments about some reflections on working with states. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. I started my career as an academic, and I'm always... Uh, um, somewhat intimidated coming back to an environment that I'm sure has changed considerably since my days where, for instance, human rights was certainly not part of the lexicon, and I'm sure you know a lot about it. Uh, what I propose to do, because we don't have a lot of time, is I'll try to speak rather briefly on this general theme of um, advancing human rights interests working with states, because I think we could take some of the, the questions that you have, which will bring us maybe closer uh, to your interests. Uh, well, first, I sh should stay, say at the outset that I started my career, and the most part of my career, was very much in law. Uh, and uh, working as the United Nations Human Rights High Commissioner was probably the first time in my entire career that the, the shift, the intellectual shift, was substantially away from law and much more into political issues. Uh, when I was the prosecutor for the tribunals, this was still... Very, a very comfortable environment for me. I taught criminal law for many years. So it's really through the human rights work that I developed an appetite, which became an addiction, to the broader political framework. And now I'm the president of International Crisis Group. Some of you may know the work of this organization, which does political analysis, essentially, uh, in, a, in an effort to prevent, manage, and resolve uh, deadly conflict. There's still a an enormous amount of human rights work at the heart of what we do, but it's now uh, it's a much broader approach. Um, my Maybe the reflections I can make about uh, advancing, promoting, protecting human rights, and having tools and strategies to work with states, let me just say at the outset that the international human rights framework has one, it has several, but has one extremely fundamental fault line in the entire enterprise. And I think it's important to acknowledge that at, at the beginning so that we're very clear about where we're going to find the balance between the, the desirable and the feasible. And the, the balance, unfortunately, very often weighs towards the feasible, very far from the desirable. And that fault line, of course, is in the United Nations uh, uh, human rights institutional structure, more specifically, in the, the uh, Human Rights Council. I, I, again, I don't know your background, so I don't know to what extent you know all these structures. That's why I don't want to waste a lot of time at the outset. But as you know, the international human rights protection structure has essentially three pillars. It has the Human Rights Council, which is the quintessential political body. It has the treaty body system, which is all these various groups that are there to ensure that states comply with the obligations that they voluntarily undertake by ratifying human rights treaties. And then it has the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, who has a, a mandate that comes directly from the General Assembly, so bypasses the Human Rights Council, to promote and protect all human rights everywhere in the world all the time. Now, 
the, when I say there's a fault line in the structure, for human rights protection to be given to an assembly of member states is really to put the wolves in charge of whatever it's called in English, the wolves in charge of the sheep. Of the sheep. Um, to put it in more uh, uh, legal terms, if we could put it this way, it's putting duty bearers uh, in charge of the protection of rights holders. So it's a system that's completely backwards. Um, and not surprisingly, it doesn't work very well. The level of the protection and promotion of human rights is not particularly spectacular when you consider that there's a community of interest amongst member states to minimize their own exposure, their own obligations. Um, so in and of itself, I think we have to recognize that this political environment is not very conducive to a very robust system of protection. What would be a very robust system of protection of human rights would be a court. Uh, and frankly, I don't think I'm going to see one in my lifetime. Maybe if you're very proactive, you may be able to persuade um, the powers, uh, you know, the ruling powers to come to that conclusion. The best human rights protection, in my opinion, comes domestically in countries that have very strong human rights protection system, particularly through their courts. And then at the regional level, at the European Courts for Human Rights, so it's when you have an impartial, independent body to adjudicate the competing demands between right holders, all of us, and duty bearers, which are states, uh, that you can make some progress, both on developing doctrines, progressive doctrines, protection, for instance, of discrimination on the basis of sexual identity or, or sexual preference, is very unlikely to come from duty bearers who do not want to see their range of duties expanded. So you would need a court, essentially, and as I said, I think it is unlikely in the extreme that we would see that happen in the international system. So what are the tools uh, and strategies that can be developed? They're already very much in place, in my view. It's by strengthening civil society, strengthening the, the collective efforts of right, right holders to advance their interests against this very, very, very powerful uh, institutional framework whereby duty bearers can minimize their exposure. When I was the High Commissioner, I attempted, I thought I was being surreptitious but extremely uh, discreet, I, I advocated for the unification of the, the treaty body system. That is, instead of having the Committee uh, Against Torture, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the Committee that's there to protect against uh, racial discrimination or discrimination against women, instead of having all these committees work independently, thereby creating an extremely obscure uh, uh, and specialized, uh, and rather invisible and inaccessible body system, to put it all uh, in one place with one sort of one front door, I thought would eventually increase its accessibility, its visibility, and therefore its impact. I thought I was, as I said, very, being very subtle that to me this was also the first step towards eventually the creation of a court. I think unfortunately some member states were clever enough to figure that out, so it was an extremely unpopular idea which went nowhere as far as I can tell, at least during my mandate. So the tools and strategies I think for interacting with states to protect human rights, it, where we currently stand, uh, will continue, I think, to have to be through extremely robust efforts by civil society actors. I think I've said enough just to give you the framework of where I come from on my thinking on these issues, and I'd rather turn to your question so we could talk also about international criminal justice or any other issue that might interest you. Thank you. That was a marvellous synthesis of some critical points, civil society, the importance of courts. Well, we have a long list of questions here. We probably won't get through them all, but let me try and um, amalgamate a few. Let us start, if we may, with the question of sovereignty. Now, when you were um, serving in The Hague, you famously uh, indicted Slobodan Milosevic, uh, who was the first serving uh, member of government to be indicted in such a way, and thereby establishing a legal precedent that removed impunity from such figures. Uh, this led, of course, to all sorts of discussions and controversies about 
uh, the sort of limits of international law against sovereignty of states. How, how do you see that tension today? Um, well, I can talk maybe a little bit about state sovereignty and then we'll come to the Milosevic indictment and the environment which allowed that um, actually to happen, which by any standard would be seen as a pretty severe entrenchment or piercing of this kind of shield of state sovereignty um, by you know, indicting in his personal capacity uh, a sitting, serving head of state um, for war crimes and calling him to account before an international body was unprecedented, certainly hadn't been done since Nuremberg, and of course all the Nuremberg <coughs> and Tokyo trials were very different. So, so, but maybe we can talk a little more broadly first about state sovereignty. I think that the, um, first of all, it's going to be with us for some time, I'm afraid, again, as a, an organizing principle of international affairs for, for all the barriers uh, that it puts to our collective efforts uh, in human solidarity to protect each other. We can talk about the doctrine of responsibility to protect. The bottom line is the world is organized politically on the basis reflected in the Charter of the United Nations of the equality of states, large and small, and they're having a seat at the table. So therefore, it's a, it's a community of states, even though the UN Charter speaks of we the people of the United Nations, at the end of the day, it's an organization of sovereign states. Having said that, uh, many uh, states assert their sovereignty when in fact they surrendered a large part of it by uh, yielding some of their sovereignty by treaty. Um, every time they take all the, they, they make uh, uh, commitments and take on obligations on a wide range of topics, not just human rights in the financial sector, in many sectors, to some extent, they voluntarily surrender a part of their sovereignty in exchange, obviously, for systems of mutual cooperation and <coughs> always. Uh, obviously, obviously acting uh, uh, in what they perceive to be their best national self-interest. So I think we have to recognize that, that state sovereignty continues to be used as a shield against external scrutiny and, and international responsibility. To my great chagrin, but I think we have to recognize that, there is really no doctrine of international public interest in the United Nations. In fact, the organizing principle is, it's a kind of marketplace principle, which is that we have to assume that all states will act in what they perceive to be their best national self-interest, and from that collective uh, self-interest will emerge an international kind of good or public interest. And it's in fact, in a sense, surprisingly, even the dominant doctrine in the Security Council which is, of course, the only fully coercive uh, body that can override state sovereignty uh, within the confines of the protection of international peace and security, defined, I think, pretty broadly now by the Security Council when it fits, when it suits its purposes, takes a generous view of it, the, the concept of international peace and security, and then it can act in a coercive manner, imposing sanctions, and ultimately even uh, uh, supporting military intervention. Um, so the organizing principle, as I said, even in the Security Council, even in the, the, uh, the, permanent, the, the five permanent members who have a veto, so the ultimate sort of power in the Security Council, is premised on the basis that states act in what they perceive to be their best national self-interest. Um, the Security Council, you know, members of the Security Council don't swear an oath to override even their national interest for the benefit of mankind. It's not the organizing principle. So I think this is still very important to recognize, particularly from those of us who do a lot of advocacy. I find it at times very repugnant to have to make an argument when you want a state to do the right thing to try to persuade them that it's in their best self-interest to do so, when in fact that's not the right argument. The right argument is that it's the right thing to do. It's a normative kind of moral argument, but that's not, that's not the way it works. The trick to make them act or, uh, is to repackage the argument, find the advantage uh, that then you try to sell to, to that state. That's the reality, despite all the rhetoric of the common good and some form of political altruism 
Uh, that's rhetoric. I mean, the bottom line is uh, diplomats have instructions to advance and protect um, their interests, reflecting <coughs> this kind of clash or coalition of sovereign states um, advancing what they perceive to be a common good uh, that suits their purposes. So in that context, the creation by the Security Council of the International Criminal Tribunals, first the one for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, in my view, was probably the, the most, um, in a sense, almost serious affront to the principle of state sovereignty because it was, one, a coercive measure taken by the Security Council, as opposed to the International Criminal Court, which, as you know, is created by treaty. So um, states voluntarily undertake a series of obligations and agree to submit themselves to the scrutiny of the International Criminal Court. Some seem to have lived to regret it. There are many African states now seem to be questioning their wisdom in having taken these obligations, and some of them, in fact, are in default uh, of assuming the obligations they undertook. But in that sense, they can't blame anybody but themselves. They undertook that voluntarily. When the Security Council created, let's start with the International uh, Tribunal for Yugoslavia, as you know, it was at the height of war, uh, you know, on the back door of Europe, with, a, I think, a daily demonstration of impotence of the international community to resolve the conflict, to or, and, and, and to bring a, a uh, termination of that deadly conflict and a catastrophic failure to protect innocent civilians who were caught in the crossfire. And I think it's fair to say that the international community, written largely, uh, was starting to feel tremendous pressure from public opinion. It takes a long time to mobilize public opinion, uh, particularly if you think of mobilizing in America to uh, interfere in the Balkans or in America and Europe to interfere in Darfur. But when the mobilization starts in democratic governments, it's felt very strongly. And I think there was tremendous pressure. When we were watching you know, the siege of Sarajevo every night on television for days and days and days and months and almost years before something was done, there was a real call for action. Security Council turned to the creation of these tribunals, which was unprecedented, as I said. Nothing had been done since the Nuremberg trials. And in doing so, it was an extremely imaginative measure to put personal responsibilities on military and political leaders, who up to then were confident that the combination of the doctrine of state sovereignty and of diplomatic immunity of heads of state had every reason to believe that they were absolutely untouchable as long as they retained enough power in their own country not to be brought to account domestically. So the tribunal was launched, um, and uh, the fact that, or first of all, Milosevic was indicted um, in May of 1999. The tribunal was created in 1994, I want to say, 93 maybe, but took a long time, almost a year to be um, actually operational, and then Rwanda was added to the, the prosecutor's um, responsibility. Uh, so Milosevic was not indicted overnight. And in that sense, it seems to me, it really demonstrated that this was not a political gesture because it took all that time. I think by the time we indicted Milosevic, we had already indicted 75, 80 people in the Balkans region for a various uh, combination of war crimes. It made it very clear, first of all, that it's very hard to investigate up the chain of command. It's not that hard to find the local perpetrators. And that actually is hard enough in some cases, particularly in cases of sexual violence, where the identification of the perpetrators is sometimes very difficult. But to then move up the chain of command to visit personal responsibility and establish either that they gave the orders or that they knew or ought to have known what their troops were were doing is very, very difficult at an investigative state. So I think by the time the tribunal issued the indictment against President Milosevic, first the tribunal had already established enough foundation for its own credibility that it was, uh, otherwise it would have been very dangerous uh, that the tribunal would be dismantled altogether. If you lose the foundation of credibility, it's you know, you don't have an army to enforce your decisions as a court. So it works fully on 
it rests on legitimacy, credibility, and compliance for the most part. So it was a very serious, and as I said, maybe symbolically and really the, the most important international kind of piercing of the shield of state sovereignty in order to enforce the idea of a kind of international solidarity to protect people from abuses perpetrated on them by their own governments. And I think since then we've seen, I don't know to what extent you have followed the development of the doctrine of responsibility to protect, but I think it's very much linked to these early initiatives of trying to, uh, uh, responsibility to protect is really articulated as um, a first visiting on every state the responsibility to protect their own people and using sovereignty not just as a shield against scrutiny, but as a bundle uh, of responsibilities whereby governments are required to assume the protection of their own people, and if they prove unwilling or unable to do so, then the international community has a, a, an obligation, not a right, a duty, a responsibility to step in, and then we can talk about how and so on. But this was very anchored, I think, in the early uh, setting of the tribunals, and I think in the credibility that the Milosevic indictment brought to the system. Now, I should, just as a footnote on this issue, tell you that when I was the prosecutor, I went, you know, I didn't investigate myself, of course, we had teams of investigators, and, but every time I went to Belgrade, I've told that story many, many times because it's absolutely fundamental. I was always confronted by the public, by politicians, by journalists, always, always with the same question, which is, this is unfair, why are you picking on us? Why, why did you start today? You didn't do anything when uh, Pol Pot was killing millions of his own uh, citizens in Cambodia. You haven't been anywhere, certainly since the Second World War, bringing anybody to account, despots and, and uh, uh, autocrats everywhere with, who all ended up in the south of France in their villa with all the money that they had stolen from people that they certainly didn't protect. You never did anything. Why all of a sudden pick on us? And this speaks, I think, to one of the fundamental, uh, still, failures of international justice, which is its lack of universality. Mm -hmm. It's a very fair point, why pick on us? Except the answer to that is the fact that others, equally guilty, are not brought to account, doesn't make you less guilty. But it makes it less just not to go after the others as well. So the answer is not to let you off the hook because we can't catch everybody. It's to work to work towards expanding the reach of accountability. And I think that's what these tribunals have done, the first two leading uh, eventually to the International Court, which itself continues to suffer, I think, from this lack of universality. You know, as long as, as the United States and China and India and Russia will not be signatories to the Rome Treaty creating the International Criminal Court, it will always be seen as a kind of double standard um, institution. That's fascinating. Uh, just following on from the point about uh, the difficulty of prosecuting for crimes against women in these situations, do you think the um, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 uh, has uh, been effective and what, if anything, has it achieved? Um, I think when, well, I, I'm not sure to what extent you know the tenants of their resolution. This, this was enacted by the Security Council 10 years ago. Uh, and it was seen, I think, at the time as a, a very progressive kind of breakthrough. It has two pillars. Uh, it, it's a resolution dealing with women in armed conflict. And it proposes basically two forms of action. One is to recognize the, the particular special victimization of women and girls in during armed conflict. And the second one calls for the empowerment of women as peacemakers. Sort of the idea is you have to bring women to the table when peace deals are being negotiated so that they can participate in peace building and reconstruction. Ten years down the road, I have to say, I think it has produced virtually nothing except a string of other resolutions and a lot of meetings and seminars and uh, colloques and high-level events and it has generated a sort of industry around 1325, and it has generated some anecdotal evidence. 
I'm not sure that um, I certainly see very few signs that it has actually made life much better uh, for women uh, in armed conflict, and in particular, I think the uh, increased uh, visibility of uh, the plight of women in Eastern Congo, for instance, where we now have continuing documentation of the level, the extent, the extraordinary extent of sexual abuse um, in a region where women have so little security, speaks pretty loudly uh, about, in my opinion, certainly the failure of the first branch. It's not hard to recognize the special victimization of women, but to be able to do so little about it, I think, really begs the question of whether this resolution should continue to be the framework uh, with which the world engages on this issue. And the engagement is there. Money is spent by donor countries. Uh, so it, certainly in, in my case, in International Crisis Group, where we do all our work is field-based, we have people all over the world in zones of in sort of states that are afflicted by armed conflict. And in our reporting, we internally have had lots of discussions about what's wrong with us? Why aren't we, why don't we seem to be able to put more of 1325 in our reports? Why aren't we reporting uh, as much of victimization of women? And why are we not sort of advocating or advancing this idea of the empowerment of women as peacemakers? And to me, there's only two possibilities. Either we're very uh, gender biased and uh, we're, not, we're not willing to do that work, or in our own work, we're hitting the inadequacy of the doctrine. It just doesn't make sense when you're there on the ground to do it that way. And I'm becoming more and more persuaded that this doctrine is ill-conceived, that this is not the way in which we will advance on the ground the plight of, of women um, that work in armed conflict. And I haven't finished with my colleagues thinking through how we will actually position ourselves and articulate maybe a more palatable alternative. The reason for that is in my own thinking, certainly what I have in mind now I think would be a hard sell internationally, but when you work in conflict situation and you look at power, you know, conflict and certainly conflict resolution and protection during conflict is all about power. People with power preserve uh, and protect the people who are loyal to them and attack others. And conflicts are resolved by powerful people sitting together and making deals. So if you look at what are the instruments of power uh, in armed conflict, there are two. And this is pretty standard, although I hate to generalize, but these two are very prevalent. One is weapons, the other one is cash. And 1325 doesn't say anything about giving women either of the tools of power. First, to protect themselves in armed conflict, and two, to be taken seriously as power brokers when they sit at negotiation tables. I mean, to have a seat at the table means nothing if you have nothing to contribute, if you have nothing to surrender, like your weapons, and part of your power, uh, and if you have no constituency, powerful constituency supporting you. Uh, and when I say money, I don't mean, and I don't want to disparage the kind of microcredit efforts in the development um, uh, industry, uh, but I'm not talking, when I talk about money in our conflict, I talk about the large bags of cash that are brought by Iranians or Americans to President Karzai. That's what I talk about. Money that allows people to feed their supporters and to build the kinds of loyalties that are at play. It's not very pretty, it's not a very attractive model, and as I said, I'm not absolutely persuaded that unless we can package it in a slightly more metaphorical way, that this uh, could become the basis of a doctrine to replace 1325. But if I had to, to guess what would likely make a tremendous difference uh, uh, in the situation of women in armed conflict, I would say their ability to protect themselves as opposed to having to wait for somebody to come and protect them, because so far this is not forthcoming. It's not forthcoming in the DRC, where the UN has more peacekeepers than anywhere else in the world, and it seems to make virtually no difference in the protection of women. So why do we keep assuming that they need to be protected? Why don't we assume that they need to protect themselves and give them at least some of the tools to do that? It's a very hard sell, um, as I mentioned, because I don't think there's going to be a great political opening to the idea of throwing more weapons 
uh, in a conflict. Although, that's what people do all the time. Why would it be so peculiar to say, let's arm women? I could hear already the outcry that would come, as though we weren't doing exactly that to advance the interests of other groups. But I know that intuitively, there'll be a tremendous pushback against the idea that we should um, give women the tools to protect themselves and call them what they are in armed conflict. It's called an AK-47, not a microcredit. So I really think that 1325, and I'm speaking to you very in a very kind of glib way, but, but I, I'd like to take it from there to, to see on what basis we could then reconstruct a framework that will be, first of all, uh, truly egalitarian, not paternalistic, which to some extent I think 1325 is, uh, but beyond that, that would have at least a better chance of making any difference to any uh, women or girl who's currently, frankly, not benefit, not benefiting, I think, at all from the 1325 framework. Let us hope that the new UN women and uh, Michelle Bachelet take these ideas forward and do something better. I have than every 30. intention of having a chat with her to see whether this has any appeal to her. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm going to throw the floor open now to take two questions, and then uh, we can resume some of these other questions to give you all a chance to um, put out something from the floor. Anybody? Yes. Would you like to say your name and, and what program uh, yeah, you're on? I'm studying on the uh, Human Rights Master's course here at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Um, and uh, just a couple of assumptions to frame the question first, but please feel free to shoot them down and play with you if you want to. Um, first is that the geopolitical influence of transnational corporations has increased massively since the drafting of the main international and regional human rights instruments. And the second assumption is that the activities of transnational corporations have a net negative effect on the realisation of the universal enjoyment of human rights, primarily due to the necessarily profit-making, a uh, profit-maximising decision-making of publicly owned companies. And so the question is then, what changes need to be made in the systems of the UN and of international law in order to ensure genuine, substantive protection of human rights in face of the seemingly inexorable rise of economic globalisation? Um, well, I'll say at the outset that I have never been a real fan of the idea of corporate social responsibility. <laughs> or am I being too subtle in answering your question? I, I'm not a huge fan because I think the corporate model is not designed. Corporations are not designed to be moral animals. Um, they're designed to, uh, um, to satisfy the instructions of their shareholders to maximize profit. In a sense, they behave not very differently from states. That is, you can make to corporations the same argument that I said at the outset you make to states, which is you should do this because it's, your, it's in your best corporate self-interest to do it. It's a very limited form of, of argumentation, but I, I would dispute, I think, part of your assumption that the, the, the growth or the, the reach and the expansion of corporate presence um, internationally has had you said maybe a net negative effect. I, I, I'm not sure that I could do the full balancing, but there are lots of instances in which it has had a tremendous kind of positive effect for the well-being of populations when it happens to coincide with a corporate interest. For instance, corporations that have shareholders that have embraced this kind of social, uh, co corporate social movement um, are telling, giving instructions uh, to the corporation as to how they want them to act, um, you know, sort of on their behalf, towards the maximization of profit, but within boundaries. So, uh, labor rights and environmental concerns are expressed. And so it works in some cases. Um, I think most corporations have. Well, first of all, as I said, the human rights framework, as we understand it today, has states as duty bearers and nobody else. So the assumption is the state will then delegate its duties to other actors so to can impose uh, duties of being respectful of individual rights to the corporate sectors, to non-state actors. But in environments where the state is so weak uh, and so absent and could barely itself discharge its own responsibility, very little is passed on. States are essentially... Uh, unable or unwilling 
uh, to, to pass on and enforce a series of responsibility on, on particularly multinational corporations. If I had to predict, though, which way this is going to go, I think that the, the corporate world that has so far been very resistant to any idea of um, a compulsory sets of norms and rules and regulations, been very resistant to that, and has been a big promoter through the global compact and so on, of voluntary compliance and set of community incentives within the corporate world to be good corporate citizens and so on. I have a sense that that's, that may shift with the increase of China as a competitor, because just as, quote, the West or the dominant form of multinational corporate presence in the field is attempting to, quote, clean up its act to be a better corporate citizen uh, and to sort of be more attuned to environmental concern, uh, to resisting forms of corruption and not to abuse local populations and to have proper labor standards, just as it, it is supposedly voluntarily moving in that direction, here comes the competition that may actually not feel bound at all by this corporate culture. And therefore, the only way to have an equal playing field is to have international regulation. So surprisingly, and once again, probably for all the wrong reasons, the right outcome might be achieved. And we may see a growth of interest in international regulations of corporate behavior that was not very attractive a few years ago may, I think, just a guess, may become considerably more <coughs> attractive now, again, to ensure uh, an equal playing field. Just a guess. Right. One more question. Yeah. Hello, my name is Paul, and I'm a student at ISA. And I have an interest in gay rights, and I really paid a lot of attention to the way you, 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 you told us about these corporations that bring uh, rights to minorities. And um, But I have a question. Uh, which, uh, which would be the most efficient way in international law to bring up... Uh, human rights for sexual minorities uh, when it comes to political movement, uh, corporate rights, uh, how can we, you know, amount to an international law when it comes to equality? Well, I think the question of, uh, <coughs> of gay rights, certainly when I became the High Commissioner, it was probably the most divisive issue even within the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. It was one of the very few issues where not only was there tremendous resistance among states, there was tremendous resistance amongst the, the office of the High Commissioner itself, both in terms of um, whether in international law it was a prohibited form of discrimination, but even amongst those who believe that we should expand, if it was not squarely part of the protective kind of cover, that we should expand it, a lot of debate about the proper strategies. And in fact, it took us almost a year internally to really come to a strategy which I then used. I spoke, I think, after I'd been one year the High Commissioner uh, at the Out Games, which took place in Montreal. And the speech I gave there was really the result of a very, very deliberate strategy, not to try to advance the argument uh, under a non-discrimination basis, because that led immediately certainly when you look at the trajectory of mature democracies and progressive countries like Canada, for instance, it leads inevitably from non-discrimination to marriage and adoption rights, which, you know, you go to Uganda and try to advance that kind of agenda. It's hard enough to just talk about protection and tolerance. To jump immediately to adoption rights and so on was just going to be so challenging. I thought the pushback would be so terrific that in fact we would do a disservice to the very community whose interest we were trying to promote. So as you may know, we put the agenda in a way which I thought no state can resist, not credibly anyway, which is protection from harm. All states have an obligation to protect all their citizens from being killed, uh, uh, being tortured, uh, being hurt, uh, being unfairly imprisoned and targeted, and, because that is irresistible. I mean, nobody can say we have a what a moral conviction that yes, we can kill gays. I mean, it's just it was absurd. So, advancing the protection agenda and the decriminalization agenda 
in my opinion, was going to have more impact on the ground and was going to be more, be easier to advance. But I can tell you, coming from a country that had done all that thinking, to me, it was such a step backwards. It was killing me to think this is how little we can really achieve in this day and age, having gone through all the, the more progressive views. But I continue to think that this was the right course of action. But I also have to say that in a sense, the question of non-discrimination on the basis of sexual identity, sexual preference, became also uh, the preferred playing field for the real um, clashes between, to a large extent, not exclusively, but north-south, um, you know, between developed countries. Not exclusively, because when you, when you get to these issues, you also have partners of convenience, because that gets you pretty quickly also into reproductive rights, uh, where the United States, for instance, is not exactly at the forefront of a progressive agenda. But for the most part, gay rights became a, the kind of rallying crowd of many developing countries, particularly in Africa, um, resisting a vision of human rights that, that they said was a purely Western construct, advancing a vision of the world that they didn't share, didn't want to be part of. So it, it was a very convenient, it's always the same thing, the same thing with abortion debates and so on. It all becomes a metaphor for the rejection of the more universal global view of human rights. So it's a hard battle in and of itself, even in very, in my opinion, advanced and otherwise egalitarian democracies, um, but it became the, the most difficult kind of battlefield for the entire human rights agenda, which, and it's often the case, huh? it's the, very often it's the weakest minorities who have to carry the burden of everybody else. It was the case for women 30 years ago mm -hmm. who became the standard bearers for equality when they were the least well-equipped to do so, and yet became very successful. But now at the cutting edge of the advancement of equality, it's that community, which is currently the weakest, as I said, even in progressive countries, that has to carry the whole burden of opening the space towards real equality. I will now return to this list and select one or two others, and then we'll have another few from the floor. Um, it's often said and felt within the UN system that the UN has suffered in recent years from a weakening in terms of its ability to act as strongly as one would wish. Do you think this is the case, and if so, why? And if it is the case, what can be done, what needs to be done to strengthen the UN system? I think it's unfortunately true. Uh, and it's, uh, there's evidence of that, including um, of the, the catastrophic casualties that UN staff have suffered on the ground, including my immediate predecessor, Sergio Vieira de Mello, mm -hmm. who was, as you know, who was killed in... In, the, in Baghdad in 2000 and, when did I go there? 2004, Four. 2003, in the summer of 2003. And of course, this obscured the fact that UN workers, particularly local staff, are killed all the time. It's a very dangerous world. They, they are killed in motor vehicle accidents, uh, in all kinds of situations. But this you know, in a sense for the UN, the killing of Sergio and, and his colleagues in Baghdad was the September, it was the 9-11 the of the UN. It was the visible, again, uh, real sign of the UN now being targeted as UN. This was not just kind of side casualties of, of the work. And, and I think it disclosed uh, a vulnerability that the UN had never felt, I think, before. And it was repeated on several occasions subsequently. It, I think it's also weaker because it is um, it it lacks cohesion, um, and people attribute all kinds of bad things to the UN. But talking about it's like talking about the US. You know, America is a very complex uh, society, and to say the Americans are like this is first first of all not all that helpful, uh, but it, it, it taints a lot of people who don't deserve at all the criticism. Who in fact share exactly that sentiment. So the UN is accused of all kinds of things when in fact some of its part are working amazingly well, particularly what are called the funds and programs 
the field agencies, ranging from UNICEF to WHO. To, I mean, there's a range of service delivery. So the less political the UN is, the more field work, humanitarian development, service delivery capacity it exercises, the better it is and the better it is perceived, although a lot of it is not extremely visible. Where it is criticized, I think, in its, it's in its political voice. So the Security Council, resolutions of the Human Rights Council, which are seen as outrageous and... <coughs> And in a sense, an enormous kind of bureaucratic paralysis that makes it not a particularly agile, modern institution. So it, I think it, and, and the other example, not only these um, killings and so on of UN <coughs> staff workers, but the growth of um, political institutions trying to bypass uh, some of the UN, like the G8 and the G20, and this growth now of uh, other players asserting a regional voice or a cross-regional voice um, that they're no longer feeling is suffi sufficiently heard in the UN. This is in part, I think, reflected by the profound crisis of legitimacy of the Security Council, where it's not the right powers that are represented, and the inability of the UN to, in a sense, reinvent itself. Um, and, and I should add, I think it's it, there's a profound malaise as well of leadership, not just in the UN, sort of worldwide, there's a, uh, I, I think, a, a sort of a disappointment about the kind of a leadership not coming forward, not only in a, an inspirational way, uh, but also inspiring enough confidence in visions and fields of activity. So it's in currently, it's under challenge, I think, politically, because its internal structures are uh, very deficient. All the, the reforms, um, <coughs> initiatives that I've been privy to, when Kofi Annan was the Secretary General, he initiated a tremendous uh, effort at reforming the Security Council, the, the Commission on Human Rights, which became the Human Rights Council. So they were efforts, but in a sense, they were still inside the box of what we talked about originally, which is state sovereignty. I think the United Nations, I think we need it's critical that we have a universal organization. The G20, for all its increased inclusiveness, is still not inclusive enough. I mean, the small states, and there are lots that are not included. So we need an organization that is truly universal. But I've never heard anybody uh, think seriously outside the box asking whether an organization of states, exclusively of states, is the way to the future, particularly when you see the growth of civil society organizations um, that are occupying, for instance, in the humanitarian sector, the delivery of humanitarian aid is 10 to 1 done by private sector civil society actors, not by the UN, which is just a coordination <coughs> umbrella. So, you know, again, if you think of national organizations of governance, like parliaments, for instance, you very often have the, the territorial representation of various districts and either to a upper house and lower house. You have two forms of representations. Um, and so it, to me, sort of begs the question of whether it's not just the Security Council, it's whether the General Assembly should not have, for instance, two layers, one representing states in another format. I'm not sure, I haven't thought this one through. I'm the champion of half-baked ideas <laughs> that I just plan and I move away and I just hope somebody's going to have the energy to flesh it out. But if you could have a United Nations that represents we, the peoples of the United Nations, through our state representation, but also maybe in a two-layer, um, a form of representation of interest groups, civil society actors, maybe divided by world population. I don't know how it would be done. It's very challenging. But that's the kind of reform that is much, much more far-reaching than asking whether you'll have two more permanent members of the Security Council, and which I don't want to say is rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic, but not exactly. <laughs> it's not quite as inspiring as thinking in a very radical way about how the world governance uh, needs to position itself. Wonderful radical thought there. Oh, yeah, I'm the champion, as I Absolutely. said. Absolutely. Radical <laughs> have they. And it's easier when I you're, I I'm now, I don't belong to any institution, so I can speak very freely. I couldn't, mm -hmm. can you imagine saying something like that? 
when I was no. an Under Secretary General no. of the Island. <laughs> we have time for one quick question, and then we must close. Um, anybody want to venture one over here? Um, building on the accusation that the UN is, uh, the system is weakening, um, and in respect of North Korea's uh, increasing non-violating behaviour and belligerent attitude to even close allies, um, do you think there's any hope in engaging the state in uh, a dialogue on human rights through the UN? Engaging North Korea yeah. on a dialogue on human rights. Well, you may be actually interested to know that there, I assume there still is, but there was when I was the High Commissioner, a resolution of the uh, Human Rights Council which required the High Commissioner to have a dialogue with North Korea. So I had the pleasure for four years of attempting to have a dialogue with North Korea on human rights, which consisted of North Korea wanted to be in compliance with that resolution. So I would call the ambassador once a year. He came to see me. We had our dialogue on human rights, and I could report to the Human Rights Council every year that in compliance with resolution, whatever it was, I had a dialogue with North Korea on human rights. This is so typical. And he was very gracious. He came every year, uh, told me all his list of grievances against my behavior, including that I had promoted gay rights and I'd said bad things about North Korea and I had done all these terrible things, and that I should be in Guantanamo, not in John <laughs> And so that was our dialogue. That was his part of the dialogue. And then I had my part of the dialogue. And then I reported to the council we had had a dialogue. I don't think that the promotion of human rights through international efforts is likely to yield much in the current environment. Um, and, and yeah, what can I say? It's just not. I, and we now work in a crisis group. We do a lot of work on the Korean Peninsula. And frankly, I think there's more hope of developing a political strategy for conflict prevention using that environment because then, again, I come back to my theme of uh, working on the interest of actors. All the actors in the region in particular, but when you're facing a nuclear power, all actors have an interest in a smooth transition, in the transition of power in North Korea, and in a political engagement that will... Um, I think, at least prevent what could be a catastrophic uh, loss of life and, and so on. So between the two, I think uh, my pathetic dialogue with North Koreans on behalf of the international community on the advancement of human rights, I think is sort of a non-issue compared to, to the need to have a, a political engagement um, with the country. Well, I'm afraid we have to end it there, but it's been an immensely rich and wonderful occasion. Thank you so much for addressing our students. Let us all join me in thanking you.